Cari amici sportivi, welcome to the local soccer show, guys. Bringing you grassroots soccer, talking to fantastic guests about exactly that. Grassroots soccer, that's our focus, the, the, the beautiful game at its, at its purest. When you're a child and you don't care about money and you just want to play the beautiful game. Guys, uh, tonight we have a fantastic guest. We have Presidente in the background, helping me as always. Uh, again, every two weeks... We come on and we try to get you a fantastic guest to share his experience uh, with grassroots and what he's giving to the game and what we're talking about in terms of how we are at, at the local level here in Quebec, Canada, uh, Ontario, further out west. We've gone to the States. We've gone to Europe. Guys, sky's the limit with local soccer, and that's what we want to bring to you. So before I bring him on, I want to... I want to just say thank you, thank you to Evangelista Sport, who sponsors the local soccer show. We would not be able to do this without you guys, the guys and girls at Evangelista Sport, the mecca of uh, calcio and uh, soccer apparel for your favorite club. Of course, mine in the back, Milan. The CF Montreal is proudly uh, displayed at Evangelista Sport as well. And guys, go check out uh, evangelistasport.com they ship worldwide they ship uh, to almost everywhere and uh, to get your uh, your little ones their cleats their shin pads their water bottles which by the way Carmelo I'm coming to steal a water bottle this week because you sold me a faulty one uh, for my poor son who can't drink water anymore so before we bring on this fantastic guest Marcello let's roll the intro Yes, and CF Montreal said yes, and we have Mr. Patrick Leduc on with us tonight, guys. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Stevie. How are you? Very good. Very good. Thank you. And again, we talked before this, guys. I said I would, I would, I would introduce him as Patrick, but we're going the rest of the show with Pat. I checked with some uh, alumni of the Impact and CF Montreal. They gave me the okay. Patrick himself gave me the okay, so we're going to go from Pat with Pat uh for the rest of the show pat i want to first start off by saying thank you very much i know you're a very busy man to give us uh, your time for tonight we're really excited to have you on uh pat you know we tried to you know we've tried to get you on we now we have you on and now we were coming up with this post like how are we going to introduce pat and you know we had you as director of the academy and then something happened right so We said we're going to go former director of the academy and give you the opportunity to tell everybody what happened. <laughs> I've got a new response, new responsibilities at the club. Um, the name of the, ti the title is the director of soccer culture and uh, stakeholders relations. So um, it's a number of things, uh, a number of responsibilities that uh, we think uh, are important and we have new challenges coming up in 2023 and there is definitely a need there to, um, you know, to support uh, our marketing efforts, uh, our, our endeavors, our initiatives with, uh, with when, when I say stakeholders, they go from our fans, our, and they, they range in all kinds uh, of, uh, we have members that have been there for a long time, some that are coming for the first time every game. And we have the most passionate, maybe, uh, groups, organized groups of supporters uh, that uh, I'll be in link with. And uh, so th those are some of the stakeholders that we're considering. Obviously, we have numerous commercial partners. And also the fact that next year uh, uh, we'll have a major um, new um, broadcast um, system uh, or a platform with Apple. Uh, and I mean, we'll, we'll talk more about this eventually when it's time, but definitely there's a, a need for us to, to be prepared um, to promote our team, our club, as well as our sport through this new platform. Uh, which isn't new, but basically a new way of uh, of having our games uh, 
brought to the fans. And this is something major going through trans that's going to transform MLS. And we're part of MLS. So we want to address this challenge and uh, I'll be part of the team taking it on. Perfect. Congratulations from us here at the local soccer show. I'm pretty sure you've got tons of messages when this was announced. And and I want to say uh, congratulations live and in person. It's an honor to uh, to to have you again on the show. I can't repeat it. I'm going to probably repeat it a couple of more times there. And right. then you can e-transfer me the money, okay? Hey. <laughs> and soccer culture, you guys are soccer culture for sure. You know, you have a podcast. You obviously, you look. You share a love for for the Rossoneri, but uh, uh, but you 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 want to discuss grassroots, and this is a subject a subject that's very dear to me, uh, and I am very passionate about. So it'll be a pleasure to sh share some thoughts and uh, to talk about this with you guys. Perfect, Pat. I want to start with you, and you know, in your career. If you could tell, you know, everybody who's going to be watching live and who's going to be watching it either on their uh, on their uh, their personal device of choice later on, uh, for people who don't know Pat Leduc, uh, how did you get into soccer? And you know, talk about a little bit of your career uh, playing, you know, the, at the from the grassroots level to 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 professional. Right, so um, so I grew up on the south shore of Montreal. For people that are not familiar with uh, with our geography, I mean, it's a suburb, uh, pretty close to the island. Uh, it's called Saint Lambert, and I grew up uh, there. Uh, my father, my mother had never played soccer. We just signed up for the the trendy summer sport. Uh, kids would sign up at my kindergarten for soccer. Nobody had any clue what we were doing, the parents, the players. We just kicked the ball around. Uh, we played colors uh, in the house league, the reds against the greens and so on. And for a couple of years, I played like that. And then uh, they had intercity teams that uh, I guess I was kind of a, a, a pretty active, uh, athletic uh, young boy. And, uh, you know, I, I was picked for the intercity team. I uh, wasn't the best player, but uh, started really, really enjoying my the, that game uh, and discovering the international game in 1986 at the World Cup. Uh, that was on TV. Canada was participating uh, for the first time. It's going to be the second time in 2022 in Qatar. Uh, so I watched the games. And then I saw other teams like Italy, like Brazil, like France, Uh, and obviously Germany and Argentina and discovered Diego Maradona. I had heard of Plat uh, Michel Platini. And, and then when I saw them in Mexico, uh, the colors were nice. The, the, uh, the atmosphere looked amazing. The fields and uh, with Maradona, it, it looked awesome. And I had just dr I started dreaming about playing soccer in a venue like this uh, uh, to to be playing in front of large crowds, which wasn't happening in Canada, basically. Um, and, and from that point on, I was really interested in soccer. I tried to, to, to get better at it. I played a lot by myself um, uh, in my backyard uh, with my brother. And, and then I, I you know, eventually moved on to a bigger club uh, in Brassard, where I saw uh, a certain guy named Patrice Bernier, who was quite good. Uh, met another player there, Gabriel Gervais, who was a bit older than I was, but I joined his team. And uh, we, um, we were very competitive, one of the better teams in Quebec. Well, we would, you know, play uh, our best games were against Jean Talon or against Saint Leonard. And Saint Leonard had a, a player, they were captained by Sandro Grande. And eventually, all these people, we ended up uh, at the Montreal Impact. Um, Before that, I did go to college in the U.S. This was a pathway that for me seemed to be maybe the highest level I would reach. So I'd been part of select teams like the Quebec team. As, um, you know, I played at the Canadian Championships, but I was never selected by national teams under 17, under 20. Um, I, I knew I was, I was pretty close, but never, uh, never called up. 
Uh, so college was was maybe something really interesting for me. I, I got a scholarship offer. I took it. I went to a university called Fairleigh Dickinson in New Jersey, which wasn't too far from Montreal. Played there for four years. And during that time, started training with some pro teams in Minnesota and then in New York, but eventually decided to come back to Montreal and join the Montreal Impact in uh, 2000. Uh, the coach at the time had been a coach with the Quebec teams, and it seemed natural for me to join with former teammates of mine that had made that step. I got an offer. I took it. And 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 then <laughs> I just stayed with that club <laughs> for 10 years, the next uh, 11 seasons, actually, uh, until 2010. So it seemed... It seems pretty linear, but uh, it, I mean, it, it's a lot more complicated than this. I just enjoyed playing soccer. Wanted to do it for uh, as much time uh, as much time as I could. Uh, you know, uh, trying to manage my studies, um, trying to manage what I was going to do later in life. Um, but you know, with the foundation of the Impact in 1993, I started watching the games started dreaming that maybe this was going to be my possibility instead of playing in Europe, which seemed out of reach, uh, college in the U.S. and then uh, professional or semi-pro for at least at the beginning um, was like the highest step I could, I, I, I could think of. Um, and then later on, you know, conditions improved. I actually uh, even played for the national team uh, in 2005. Um, you know, after winning the championship with the Impact in 2004. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, I really enjoyed playing here in Montreal in front of my family, my friends. Uh, and that actually helped me for the rest of my career. It, 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 it uh, you know, I, I guess we'll get to that. But I eventually started doing my coaching licenses, uh, started getting involved in the media, um, and, and before you go on, before you yeah. go on, sorry to interrupt you because it's an important it's an important question sure. that I love to ask you all. And you know, the, the great people that you you you've mentioned, Pat uh, Pat Bernier and uh, and uh, and Sandro, all uh, all guests of the show, and I've asked them the same question. Did you think, as you were getting as you were winding down, and again, I'm going to compliment you here. You're one of the ones who got better, like wine. You, uh, the older you got, you got better, and uh, and you and you enjoyed a lot of success. Was there a point in time during that journey where you said, "Is soccer gonna be my career after I finish playing?" It was always clear to me that soccer was gonna be a part of whatever I do, um, and I, I, I it wasn't clear to me how and what exactly I was going to do. But um, even from a very young age, I knew that uh, playing sports was very important to me. You know, going to school, uh, phys ed was my favorite class. Uh, uh, the recess was always a game of some sort, mostly soccer. Even lunchtime, we would eat really quickly, go back in the schoolyard and play. Um, and then when I, I realized later, when I went to high school, I was missing that because my high school didn't have a soccer team. Uh, we didn't play any games at recess. And I, 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 I'm not going to say I got depressed, but I realized how important this is to me, especially when later on in high school, we didn't have Spavitsit back then. We didn't have the academy. Uh, so you had to go and train in gyms at night uh, I, I I lived on the South Shore, but I would, you know, take the metro to saint claude robillard or to to gyms in somewhere in Montreal where Quebec teams would train, where leagues would take place. You know, I would go to Laval for uh, what we, we used to call the Bell Nations League. And because this was where you could play and eventually ended up playing five, five nights a week. Or and this was my training regimen, but I was used to it, and I I would still go to school the next morning, but I loved it. You know, I didn't I didn't mind going go going out at night. Yeah, I didn't like going on the metro all these nights. I I, I begged my parents to drive me to most yeah. of the practices, and they they wouldn't after a while. I actually biked to to my practices uh, when I played in Brassard for most of them. 
uh, it probably helped my cardio. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no. So, so it was always so important to me when I was young and I wanted to make it last the, as long as I could. I wanted to play for as long as I could. So when you get to U18, U19, then what's next? You know, you have to play senior and senior is a, a strange beast when you're young, you know, you're playing with adults and, and, and then there's like this maybe CJEP or uh, college university, which is like a lifeline. You carry on and you play with the, uh, everything that you, you enjoyed as a kid, playing in tournaments, playing in front of people that actually watch you. Uh, and, and then it's going on to the pros. And then when you realize that making it, making a living, uh, uh, being a pro is very fragile. It's very tough. Um, then I, I already started thinking, well, I, I want to make this happen, but I'm not earning, uh, you know, much of much money right now. Yeah. I need to find a side, a sideline or a job or a second team, or I don't know how, but you got to figure out something. Uh, so I got into coaching because they started offering not necessarily full-time, more like part-time uh, jobs, but we're talking early 2000s not many people are living off this sport in, yeah. in the province. And now a lot of people are because you're coaching, you're a director, you could be a GM for a club, you could work, uh, you know, uh, managing a center, you could, yeah, there's all kinds of jobs yeah. related to our sport, even in the media, uh, which was something unheard of uh, 20 years ago. So there's a lot of growth and there's a lot of opportunities And that's what I tell, tell young kids. I, you know, I coach them and I, they want to reach a high level. But if they're really passionate about the game, I hope that they stay involved in, in the capacity in the future because we need the, if we want the game to grow, we need people who have played the game and have, have felt the emotions that you live when you're on the field and that make decisions related, related to that. Because when we grew up, we didn't have that many people that coached us that had played. Uh, or that knew how to, to build a club or a structure that makes sense uh, so that we get better at soccer here. Yeah. No, I agree with you 100%. And we talk about that, you know, uh, whether we're having, we're getting together with a co for a coffee, uh, whether we're at the field, just the, the avenues of success for these kids are something that they're having. I don't think they understand that. I try to pass that on with them too. Even even as young as nine years old, you know, like just making them. I, I talk to my son and I coach my son, which is probably till this day one of the hardest things that I've done, because I, I'm trying to make him understand that this sport gave me not only the love and the passion of soccer, but showed me so many life skills: how to respect my teammates, how to respect an opponent, how to be an opponent with someone one day, and then the next day I'm friends with him. And, you know, I'm trying to pass this on, but, you know, my next question to you is like you've seen, you know, growing up in the soccer, in the soccer world like you have and now coaching now. Do you see that there's a huge difference in terms of the generational gap if we compare a nine, a 10 year old from back in, in the 2000s to a nine year old or a 10 year old now in 2022? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think... <laughs> As we get older, we, we tend to think that a lot of things were a lot better back in the day. And, and, and sometimes we forget how much progress there's been. Uh, I, I happen to think that there's a lot more good players in the province or in Canada than there used to be, just because there's a lot more players and there's a lot more um, exposure to high-level soccer uh, compared to what we had now. This being said, I still think that we had quite good, quite, you know, quality generations. I'm born in 77, 77, 78, 79, 76. We had pretty good players that came from this generation and maybe had uh, the, a good opportunity in the early 2000s to, to play, uh, whether here or abroad. Um, and, I mean, the space was there. The stage was set. It was it was being built in the 90s, and in the 2000s, we we just you know occupied the stage. 
It, are there more good players than uh, than there were in the 2000s? It's a good question. Um, you know, the, it's. I think there is. I think there are more good players, and some will even go further than we we have. But uh, there's still that larger. I would say there's more like good triple. Uh, we we would call it triple A. Yeah, <laughs> the triple A caliber player. There's more than there used to be. But the really high quality, uh, high level elite player, there's still a few, you know, a few of them. Uh, I think now, however, there's a better stage, a bigger stage. Uh, and there, you're, the spotlight now is incredible for young talents, whether here in Montreal or in Toronto or anywhere in Canada, because there's MLS, because Canada's qualified for the World Cup. And nowadays, Canadians can't play in Europe. Many of them are, you know, and the door is a lot more open for the next generations because people are going to say, well, there could be, you know, an Alfonso Davies somewhere in Canada. There could be a Jonathan David lying somewhere, you know, and maybe there was in the past, but we didn't give them that chance. Uh, so now there's going to be more players that, that probably are going to get an opportunity that, would not present to uh, would not be presented to you know players from my generation, so. Uh, but but you know your your question about numbers and it's it's a hard one. I think there will be more uh, good players because there's more facilities, there's more good coaching, um, but you still need like that hard competition that really really brings out the like the top the best out of the players, and we still need to work on that. Yeah, you know, Pat. Uh, one other question before we get to the meat and potatoes of the local soccer show is, you know, is I'm always interested with, you know, you, you know, people like yourself who got that scholarship and went and play university ball in the States. Uh, again, let's put, you know, time in, in, into consideration here. You know, what was the type of quality of play at that university level when you were when you were playing uh, in the States? Yeah. Um... So look, I uh, I was part of the Quebec teams. Um, so I mean, if you're looking at numbers, maybe it's the best 18 players of uh, of that year, right? Uh, that are part of a, a, a Quebec team. Um, and and I got a scholarship. And three of us uh, on our our AAA team got scholarships. Patrice Bernier was one of them. You know, uh, I was another. And so we went on to, to, to a team that I thought at first was technically pretty weak overall. I thought the, the level of the technical level of the players, I was in the stronger one. I was, you know, stronger than most of them. And I thought the average player in my AAA team was better technically than in my club team than uh, the university players uh, were. But then I realized it, it was a lot more physical and like, like at a level that we're just not used to. We don't see it here in Quebec or in Canada. Maybe the referees, the officiating uh, contributes to that. But um, in the U.S., I mean, it's a lot more physical. It was. Um, and I struggled for a year. And I thought I was one of the better players, but I couldn't just, I couldn't impose myself. And it took me a, a full year. The second year, I was a lot more ready, a lot more aggressive. And I realized that when I came back to, to Quebec to play in the summer, people thought I was aggressive. I got more yellow cards. And, and for me, that, that was the new norm. Yeah. So the level of play, it's a good question. Weaker technically, but so much, so much more physical. And that helped me grow, actually. For a number of years, it, it helped me. I don't think without that, I don't I don't think I make it as a pro. Wow! Because because you, I I don't think I would have uh, been challenged enough uh, by staying here uh, to to actually play at a higher uh, at, at a higher level. Um, the technical uh, basis was there, so uh, learning to play physical is is something that can that you'll need it's a it's a, it's a new skill set basically um and we played really good teams every year you know so we you know we were playing 500 my my club uh my my university um we never reached the the top top uh um 
finals, the, 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 the NCAA finals with 48 teams. We didn't reach them when I was there, uh, but we played really good teams like uh, University of Virginia, for example, uh, that I remember uh, they had national team players. So those were really good experiences. And, uh, you know, I was close to New York City, so there's a lot of good players there that, uh, that end up trying to play for what they used to be called the Metro Stars. They became yes. the New York Red Bulls. Um, you know, yeah, there's a player that played at Milan, Roberto Donadoni, that I went to watch a couple of times yeah. <laughs> because he was playing there. Um, and you know, we, we would play against their B team or their, their reserve team. And so you get a lot of exposure and then you realize, okay, so you need to be good. Technically you need to be really fast, but if you're physical, you know, and you know, you've got a chance and, um, and then that's, you know, a lot of player, a lot of coaches wanted me to play as a defender. I thought I was a midfielder and I, I, w I ended up being both as a pro. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was a defender that uh, because I, I had played as a midfielder, I was able to distribute distribute the ball a lot. So that was like a skill set that I could bring because I wasn't as a hard tackler like others. So, yeah. So uh, that's kind of uh, what I learned there. Amazing. Pat, let's get to the meat and potatoes. Yeah. We're talking about grassroots. I would be. Not asking you the proper question if I didn't start with the Canadian club licensing program. You know, this is where, you know, Canada came in and basically uh, put in a, a really uniform structure for all the clubs in the different provinces and ranked them national, provincial, or regional. When you saw this and when, if you were exposed to it or have, you know, colleagues that have been exposed to it and know about it, what's one thing that you like about it and one thing that you don't like about it? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a great idea. First of all, I think uh, we need to accept that can Canadian soccer has, uh, it's been a very popular sport for so many years. In the 80s, it, it was already called like the sport that's coming up, right? That's growing. In the 90s, and when I played in the 2000s, it was, oh, uh, It, you know, your sport is the next hockey or uh, I heard it all, you know, I heard it for 20, 30 years. And yes, there's a lot of players, uh, a, a lot more than there used to be. There's indoor centers that we, we didn't have. But the level of our game overall has not up until this year where we qualified for for a World Cup. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't claim that we we're making, you know, strides at developing the game. Um quality wise you know we we were able to host the under 20 world cup here in canada in fantastic event in montreal right uh very exciting a lot of attention people really really uh you know went to to to, to watch the games but canada you know didn't do so well the our team was you know uh didn't didn't win any games and struggled really Uh, in, you know, we, maybe they played good teams. They played Chile that I think Chile was in the finals against Argentina or, uh, we're, we're actually, we're a really good team, Chile, maybe third place. I'm not so sure, but they had Alexis Sanchez and Arturo Vidal and yeah. a lot of, you know, players that have played at a really elite level, but Canada was nowhere near them. And then in the 10 years after nothing really changed. So. So you look at this licensing program, and I think it's not only a good idea, it's necessary for us to look at the mirror, look in the mirror and say, well, we need to, if we want to take this seriously, we got we to gotta offer a better service. And one of the comparisons I, ha I, I would make is, you know, if you sign up your child for a swimming lesson, you'll get somebody certified for sure that's going to teach them for security reasons and then because you know it's it's a life skill basically you need to learn how to live in water or move in water and to survive if you ever go into water so you need somebody qualified to, to, to teach the class and then you know if you go on to you know higher levels it, you get a better a better instructor but soccer is nothing like that soccer you sign up your kid there's no instructor 
there's there's no one available. It's it's a voluntary person who they're going to pick from the crowd, a parent, and who's never very often has never played and doesn't have any basis, and he's going to take over the team. And 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 if we're lucky, maybe there's a soccer background, and maybe there's there's some teaching. Uh, uh, there's there's a way of of instructing that that is a. Uh, you know, if he's a teacher, there's a capacity to teach and to convey some some content. Uh, but soccer, we treated it like it's a leisure. It's not a sport. It's like, okay, just do this. And when winter comes back, go back to hockey. Basically, like the secondary sport all the time. Yeah. And, and so we didn't take it seriously. And the licensing program wants to change that. So I like it. That's what I like about it. It's like, okay, you want to do this well? Uh, you need to, you know, uh, get up to standard. Now, what, what what is difficult about this, what is not as, uh, what I don't like as much is there's a lot, a lot of attention uh, put on very important com uh, departments in the club, uh, the finances, the governance, uh, the infrastructure, and they're necessary. But... Um, there's there's been quality work done uh, over you know the past years decades um and there's you know there's more than one way to achieve quality uh so when you 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 set standards and you you try to how can i say this um you know you, you want everybody uh to at the at the very least offer the the minimum quality uh, so that's 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 important, um, but you don't want to reinvent the wheel, okay? Um, and I know that you want to talk about CDC, and I think I like the idea behind the CDC. Uh, Good segue, Pat. Good segue. Yeah. That's the next question. Let's talk Good. about CDC, Pat. Yeah, <laughs> CDC. The idea is that you're so if, if we're in Belgium, here's what they think, and I like their philosophy. Small country competing with uh, monsters like France, Germany, England. Belgium has a smaller population. Uh, so they say we cannot uh, have one player that is not looked at. We cannot ignore anyone within our sport. So everybody's involved. Everybody's coach. And who knows, you know, uh, the, your top U10s, they're not necessarily going to be the national team in the future. Maybe it's your your B or your C level players that are at U10 become much better later on and they end up being on the national team later. Um, so I like that approach. CDC is saying we're going to offer the same service to everyone. So I like it. I, I, I like the fact that nobody's going to get ignored. But um, the reality is that not everybody has the same level of interest. And not but not everybody has the the same level of uh, commitment uh, to to the sport, and and you're kind of um, somehow because of a, a a giant formula, you cannot spend as much time with the the, the players that uh, really want to to improve. Uh, you you need to spread it out, right? Uh, so you, you know, that's something that I don't like, you know, as much about CDC, uh, and the fact that, you know, you need to, to, um, uh, how, uh, you know, you need to spread your, your wealth, your, your yeah. resources so that uh, your coaches are seeing a lot of players, but they don't pay as much attention to, to, uh, to, to each player. And I feel like, you know, basically, you end up playing. You end up learning a lot from just playing, just yeah. playing the game, you know. And and I hear that from the CDC uh, philosophy that in the end there should be less coaching. There should be just like street soccer. Just you know, let them play. And the CDC, there's so many standards with the licensing. There's you need you need to have coaches involved on on all the the parts of the field, and and in the end. You're kind of, um, you're kind of uh, inciting clubs to have player uh, coaches really involved in everything, and there's less playing than there should be. 
Yeah. And that I don't like. Yeah. I don't like because <laughs> look, when we played, we would end up with a game at every practice. Yeah. If I didn't have a game at the end of my practice, I got mad. Yeah. I got mad at the coaches. I got mad at my parents because that's the whole point. So with CDC, I, I noticed that sometimes there's a rotation and maybe you end up doing a ladder drill instead of playing at the end, you know, and I know that some clubs are correcting that. Yeah. But if you don't play at the end, you're missing out. How interested can you stay in, in doing drills? If, yeah, if, if, I may, if I may, Pat, because I, I went through the CDC this year for the first time, you know, and what I noticed is the CDC, there's four ateliers, there's four, there's four stations. The worst possible thing that could happen is that your, your group of kids goes to the game section, the first one. Mm. If they go to the mini game first, you've lost them for the rest of the hour and a half. They right. don't care what drill you're going to do. They don't care if there's, they don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you said. At the end of the, at the end of the practices, when we played, there was a game and the coaches held that game against us as a ransom. Do your drills during this time period and we'll play at the end. We'll scrimmage at the end. So my question to you for the CDC, which I, I understand and I like that, you know, they have to spread their wealth and everybody should get the same coach. It, it, it's two questions. One, when we played, and again, I'm I'm a little bit younger than you, it was you made the AAA. You tried out, you made it, and you're in this AAA and you're in, and you've made the team. You've made competitive, not AAA, AA, A, so on. You made competitive soccer. Right now, what I see the clubs are doing is you pay, you play. And like you said, some people are paying and their kid's interest is not worth the amount of money that they're paying. How do you think the clubs can adjust to that? Because I understand there's a financial aspect to this. But when, as a club, do you say, you know, after he does it one year, two years, you say maybe the, the CDC or the competitive soccer is not somewhere where your kid is having a good time? So... Yeah, and I, I think you can tweak your CDC so that, <clears throat> you know, you end up playing more games. And I think that's that's really a reflection that I would have if I was in charge of, uh, of uh, a center like that, a CDC, because you, 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 you know, this is the, the best way to get fit when you're injured is to go back to playing. You know, when you're coming back, you know, you get your fitness from playing. So, you know, running, lifting weights and all of that is they help when you when you, you're trying to get better at soccer. But there's no better way than just playing. <laughs> and and so uh, CDC, you you there's there's really I think there's a, a good idea. Behind, there's a good philosophy behind it. But really, you know, our our young our young generations will get better not necessarily because of a CDC. They'll get better because they play a lot. They play with their friends. They need to get in the like the hours uh, to, 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 to get better at the game. And when they come to CDC, they should get a little extra. They, when they come to a club, they should learn something a little, a little bit more that when they go back home or they go back to, the, to school, when they play, they try to implement it. They try to use it. Because really, you get you get better at this by practicing with your friends or by yourself. Yeah. Uh, it's I don't think it's it's up to a club or a parent to make someone a better player. It comes from the passion from within and the hours that they spend uh, playing. So uh, about your point with the levels, you know, I I feel like you know there there has to be uh, something uh, available for each level for each each uh, each is a desire really yeah. um, and and some people some players will will want to play at a higher level but there should be you know uh, standards that you know I, I I think it was in Iceland I remember a presentation where clubs would play each other. And the A teams would play the A teams and the B teams would play the B teams and the C teams would play the C teams. Um, and, you know, I think that's an approach that we try to 
we tried to imitate, but it's hard to to copy that approach in our province because you have a lot of distance and and I and I think in time, I think in time, um, you know, our what we used to call triple A leagues now they'll they'll call them PLGQ. Um, I think the better players will go to that level, and I don't think it, there should be a rush to to make it happen before 14 years old. I think yeah. the U11s, U12s, U13s. It's fine that they stay local, that they play in a few tournaments and they go somewhere else. But you shouldn't have to travel like more than an hour, an hour and a half, you know, very often for a game. If you do when you're young, you just get tired from it too yeah. early. And I don't think that's, that helps in the end. So, you know, I, I remember AAA. There's a lot of good things about it, but there's a lot of, uh, of players that would lose interest by the time they were 15, 16 years old. And that's not necessarily what I want to go back to. Yeah. I just think that we need meaningful games more often. We need competitive games. And, and it's hard in Canada because if you really want to get the competitive games, we need to play like Toronto teams, Ottawa teams more often. And that's, it's just far, the, yeah, you know, far. but, but, but you need to make it happen, you know, two, three, four times a year just to get used to it. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're playing, you're, you know, you're a big fish in a small pond, and that that happens too quickly in Canada. Yeah. Another question for you, Pat, before we move on from CDC and, and we'll, we'll switch over to the academy because I'm pretty sure that we, we have tons of questions for that, is, you know, the CDC, from what I've seen, and again, this is just me and it's my personal opinion, and I'm, no, I'm not attached to the club, it's me. I, I feel like the CDC is concentrating a lot on individual skill and we're missing the team aspect of, uh, of soccer. And, you know, we talked about games, but not only games. You know, we talked about it earlier, the, you know, the, the different emotions that you go through when you're playing a game, uh, being tied 1-1 and scoring the winning goal, being, uh, you know, uh, scoring the winning goal for your team. Uh, those emotions, what I noticed with my group of kids is that, yes, on an individual level, they were getting better. But as a team, they were not understanding soccer. They were not understanding that they had a responsibility at a certain position when they were playing that position. You would play multiple positions in a game, but there's an accountability and a responsibility. How do you think the CDC could switch it up to start including more in-game situational stuff for the kids? Not super Pep Guardiola tactics hmm. I hear, but just the basics so that we know. You know, when you're playing left back, you got to be responsible and play left back. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm. it's not a big concern for me if uh, I, a young player doesn't understand the positional uh, nuances of uh, left back, uh, midfield, or, or forward so much. You know, I think, honestly, uh, uh, you know, uh, before you're 10 or 11, just really understanding what your mission is when you have the ball, when you don't have the ball, that, that goes a long way. And, and even if you try to, you know, pound it in their heads, they're very young and, and um, you're kind of wasting energy to try to make them realize, you know, how a back line should move because their, their, their level of um, engagement with, uh, with partners is limited. You, there's a relationship between themselves and the ball. There's a relationship between themselves and the ball and maybe the first opponent. And maybe then they get to a teammate. But four, five, six teammates at once is too much. And eventually, when they're 11 and 12, they start connecting with more than one teammate. My, if I'm a left defender, I have my right defender, and I've got a winger in front of me. Okay, I can connect with these two. Sometimes some guy on the other side, maybe my goalkeeper, yeah. but, you know, I, I'm adding uh, variables one at a time. It's it's too abstract to say, hey, you got to tuck in from the sideline on the weak side and it's too much. You, they'll execute because, you know, some coaches will really tell them what to do. But that's not in really progress because they're they're just they're just doing what they're told and they're not thinking by themselves. If they start thinking by themselves. And some of them are from a really young age. They they will they will be able to learn later on, you know, little aspects of when I need to tuck in, when I need to stay back, when I need to go up. Um, and 
but 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 what I would suggest about the CDC is if you played small sided games and you have roles or missions for if if it's 4v4 for example or 3v3 and you have simple concepts like one player has to be uh you know staying back or one player needs to always be on the opposite side you know not everybody on the same side just with uh, like a half line or uh those those can help and those will stimulate their thinking And it'll help a lot more when you get to a point where I want the left back to move up. What does the right back do? Well, I think I should get closer. Things like that will come naturally to them. So I think the CDC can really help in positional play in that aspect. You know, you can play games where when you have the ball, you need to be outside a perimeter. And when you lose the ball, you need to be inside to, to win it back. Things like that, I think, makes sense. Uh, and they'll help with the positional th uh, aspects that... You know, every kid is struggling with really, uh, you know, below the age of 10. And, and to, you know, you could see some teams that have really good positioning at a very young age, but I really believe that it's not because they're thinking. It's just because they're forced to play that way. And to me, that's not progress. Yeah. That doesn't make a more intelligent player. It makes a player that will, you know, will just do what he's told. And that's not an intelligent player. Yeah. No, very very valid point. Very valid point, uh, Pat. If we uh, if we could switch over again in the, again context of time, there uh, we can. I think we can talk for for two hours, but I know you're very busy. So if we'll, let's move on to the the CF Montreal and the academy. So during your time as the director at the academy, just a brief overview of you know some of the important changes that you guys made and you put in place. All right, so well, I ended up uh, starting at the academy as the director during COVID times, and we there were, there are a number of uh, yeah tweaks to our structure that we we kind of were forced to think about and then to execute. Um, so one of the major changes we've gone through is the pre academy. Our pre academy used to be U8 to U12. Um, and we have a partnership with Soccer Quebec. And at the technical level, the discussion we had with Soccer Quebec was that with the club licensing and the selection process that really starts, uh, you know, at about 14 years old, basically, um, you know, is there a reason for us to keep uh, a selection of players at a pre-academy level at U U8? And we agreed that... Uh, in, It wasn't a program that necessarily really improved our academy um, because the, the first of all the the number of players that were we were able to select was limited and and you also you know you you I, I mentioned about that you know how kids start traveling at a very young age to go play with the, a club team that isn't isn't close to their house that's not desirable. Um, and we, we feel that a lot of clubs are doing uh, decent work with U8s, U9s, U10s, U U11s. So we decided to focus uh, from U12 and up. And uh, in the end, started uh, we're going to start the pre-academy at U13 from next year on. Uh, we think that scouting-wise, having regional programs uh, with the, the regional associations Uh, will help us scout uh, a lot of the players at U12, eventually start uh, making a team at U13, and then preparing for the, the academy. The academy really starts at U15. Okay. Um, so so we, we will keep two levels, U13, U14. They will play in the league, in the PLSGQ. And uh, so we, we are focusing our resources on the higher, higher levels, U13, U14, Academy is U15, U17, and we have a U23, which is really a reserve team for the pros. Uh, the, 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 again, just for the context for everybody who might be listening and doesn't know, the academy, even at the pre-academy U8, this was a, a, per, a per tryout. It's not that you you guys did a, you, you made the kids try out and you selected from the yeah. crop of kids that, that presented right. themselves. Exactly. So, Now, now we're, we're removing this, and the, these kids will go and play in their near their home and their regional, and and the and CF Montreal will either keep tabs on these original who were part of the original pre academy, and again, like you said, some will 
hopefully continue to progress at the club level. And yes, hey, we'll see you at uh, at 13 years old. And some, yeah. unfortunately, might digress, right? So, and, and there's, you know, and there's, uh, again, that, that, that ever-revolving door uh, uh, of a football academy. Right. Have you taken or, you know, because uh, uh, in Italy... You know, we're, what we're used to is like the, the clubs, the, the RDP, the Jean Talon, the Saint Leonard. The, they're called almost in Italian, it's called Scuola Calcio, so mm -hmm. school of soccer. And their sole mission is to is to to identify and train these these kids so that they do come to the academy. Is this something you know? Because it's no secret, CF Montreal and Bologna share the same they share the same owner. Is this some kind of is this you getting together with uh, the, with Bologna and talking about a strategy of this Scuola Calcio feeding the academy? And is Soccer Quebec okay with that? So I, our objective is to get better at scouting the, the, the players that uh, deserve and have the level to be at the academy. Um, when the academy was founded over 10 years ago, uh, we had open tryouts and Uh, you pick the best players out of the ones that come, right? So you're really picking from the ones that come to you and not necessarily picking from the ones that, you know, uh, have not come and maybe should be present. Yeah. And for various reasons, a lot of players did not come to tryouts or did not accept coming to the academy uh, because of the schools or the language or the distance. And gradually the academy improved with, new partnerships on the uh, academic level on, uh, you know, trying to get families, hosting families for, for players that live from, uh, you know, outside Montreal and, and similar also, to hockey, similar to hockey. Yes. And also scouting, scouting, but, you know, we have limited resources in the scouting. You know, you try to go watch a lot of games trying to see, uh, you know, players that uh, maybe you get uh, that get recommended to you. Um, and we overcame a lot of challenges, uh, but we still think that, you know, our, the process needs to get better. So we need to scout more, uh, you know, in, in every region in Quebec, and we need to scout for a longer period. Because scouting, when you go watch a game, you're really taking a snapshot. Uh, same thing with a showcase or a combine or a tryout. You're taking a picture. You're seeing the player in a, in a moment uh, and, you know, that player will evolve or not do as well the next time you see him. So it's really hard to make a judgment and to commit to a player for a number of years with only one tryout. So the scouting needs to take place over time and you need to build relationships with a lot of clubs. We have relationships with clubs and regions now that we think will help uh, make uh, help us make better decisions and and realize that if you miss on a player at U14 that uh, maybe he didn't convince you or uh, he wasn't in his best day, but you've seen potential in the past and you, you, you keep tabs on him, you mentioned that. We just, you know, we recruited players at the U17 level this year, this summer. Uh, because we think that there's players that, you know, didn't come in the academy over the past two years that have evolved in their clubs and now maybe should be part, should be amongst the best. Um, they should be considered amongst the best players in the province at this time at a U17 level. So we always got to keep our eyes out. And if we have clubs that we have good relationships with, we'll trust them, you know, when they make a recommendation that even though a player had a tryout, maybe didn't come across as the best player or the best talent, there's strong recommendation that he should, you know, we, he should be involved at the academy. Then, you know, we'll follow that recommendation and, you know, trust our partners that a player will, you know, will, will, you know, has what it takes basically, because some of the clubs will know a lot better. They've seen them in all the games over years, the progress, the capacity to learn the desire Uh, you can't always see that over, a, you know, a two-day trial. You know, and again, just to just to add to that, wouldn't wouldn't CF wouldn't it be in the best interest for CF Montreal to actually have these clubs be the scouts for them? Um, yes, I mean it, it's 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 a system that could work, but in the end, also uh, we realize that. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, of course. Like in, 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 a, coach, you know? yeah. in, in a perfect world, uh, yeah. we don't have favoritism and uh, right and, and all that uh, that fancy stuff. But uh, again, again, just going back to the way you know the club should be feeding the professional club in the in the city or the country. Uh, that again, I don't see why a club would not want to have that relationship with CF Montreal. It should be beneficial to both, you know, CF Montreal yeah. in terms of. You know, not having to displace people to RDP or St. Leonard because they have a trusted person there to scout for them. And then RDP or St. Leonard or Jean Talon having the ability to say, hey, we have this great relationship with CF Montreal. And, you know, we've seen it with, you know, Ville Saint Laurent, uh, you know, uh, passing on uh, the, the youngster to, to, the, to the impact and the impact uh, being able to, to, to profit and to actually... Uh, have a stage for for a younger player to to either play with the team or or, or continue on, right? So, uh, mm-hmm. again, I know it's it's again it's a, it's a loaded question because we think the same. In a perfect world, that's the way it should work. But you, as humans, there's always that 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 we love. Like I love my son, yeah. But in reality, he's not the best player, right? So, but, but you know, it's, it's I mean, you coach a team and. You, you know, basically, it comes down also to the fact that, you know, you want to make your decisions about your team and with your club. And, and you know, you, you build good relationships and recommendations are important. But in the end, as a coach, we all want to make, you know, kind of have the final word and make our own opinion. So this is kind of how it works. And I, I, I don't think we'll ever change that. Uh, so our scouts will, you know, will we'll always trust someone that has given us a good player in the past, you know, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and when something doesn't quite work out, it's, it's tougher to, to always trust uh, the opinion after if you don't have the context or you don't understand how things didn't pan out. But, and, 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 and the truth is also that sometimes some players aren't made for uh, certain clubs or an academy structure. They are really talented, but they need, Uh, different conditions to flourish um, and 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 some players you know it's by seeing what they with with you know uh, I, I mentioned the intensity or the, the the physical physicality of the U.S. college game back in the 2000s or 90s and I realized as an academy director that um, we have talented players that uh, that uh, come to our tryouts and and maybe look good over a week of training with the academy. But if they're not confronted with uh, the intense games that we play in the MLS Next League, they there's a bit of a shock. Uh, yeah. And uh, they, they, they don't always react well to the challenge. And it's not necessarily like much better soccer, but just a lot, a lot more intense and a lot more committed. Uh, a lot more there need there's a, a lot more focus and concentration that's required um, and I feel like um, coaches also need to be exposed to that local coaches need to see that to realize okay so maybe my player is not quite ready for that next step he's good he, he, he does well but is he ready to to you know uh, to accomplish this at, at uh, you know in a different setting And, and yeah, so so yeah, I invite a lot of coaches to watch the academy teams play this year. They, they'll get a feel for a revolution, yeah. you know, Philadelphia Union, for example, Red Bulls, and and yeah, it's it's uh, it's good to see. Uh, I would love to watch the academy play. That would sure. be that would be really cool. Uh, again, just to piggyback on that again, what about Sportitude? What are your thoughts on Sportitude? And you know, are you happy the way uh, the way that's that's set up? And and and, and again. Have you ever seen someone from Sportitud uh, be uh, be a candidate for an academy or or, or to okay. be at the next level? So Sportitud, I, I I think it's a great formula. The f- first off, I'll say that I mean the fact that you you have a government that allows and schools that allow uh, young athletes to you know uh, practice their sport for half a day uh, and that it's you know, uh, uh, this, you know, the, the, the school subjects are, the classes are organized in such a way that you can, uh, you can practice your sport in the afternoon or in the morning, depending on your sport and still go home and have a reasonable, um, you know, uh, uh, 
a day in the life is reasonable. You don't have to to go out at night for two additional hours and really you're 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 just worn out at the end of the week because you you've been spending a lot of time playing your sport um, outside of uh, class hours. So I like Spolitzut for that. Um, what what the element that's missing is that um, the Spolitzut is not related to your club. Uh, and in that sense, it doesn't make much sense um, because the, you're you're just training for training. Yeah. You're not training and playing a game at the end of the week. So you're losing out on a lot of what you're accomplishing and learning. You can't really apply it. It's like it's like you uh, you you study all week and the exam is not taking place at the end of the week with that with at school it's taking place in a different setting uh, <laughs> over the weekend so you're not being you're not being graded by the same teacher that taught you the whole week yeah. and there's i mean something's not is missing you're taking out that aspect that that lesson aspect the ransom aspect that you were mentioning yeah. uh, when you you know you said uh, if you guys do the drills you'll get to play the game at the end of the week Well, you have really good coaches in a lot of sports, but they don't they don't coach the players during a game setting. They do for friendly games, but it's not the same as the league. So if you could combine a sports with a club or the sports becomes the club, I don't know which way you put it, but the same group that trains for five days tra plays at the end of the week, you'll make progress. Yeah, make that's progress. a fantastic idea. Yeah. And and yeah and, and and I know that our sport is related. It's uh, at the municipal level. It's city soccer. You know, clubs are standalone uh, organizations, and they they do quite well. Um, soccer has been is not a school sport like football is a school yeah. sport. Um, but the fact that it's not happening at school means that you know there's no school rivalries like uh, like you have at football or uh, basketball and you know what when you when you play at the city level your parents go to watch you until you're 12 13 14 maybe to carry on yeah you know, so, but by the time you're 15 16 there's less and less parents at the games and there's there's fatigue and 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 if you had school uh, soccer at school then you'd have your fellow students watching you, encouraging yeah. you. That's what they have in the U.S. And yeah. I'm not saying the U.S. is great because high school no. soccer is not so good. Mm -hmm. But when you have fellow students, uh, you know, encouraging you, it changes, it changes, it drives your motivation. Well, you Pat, the, the perfect example is, is high school football. In, yeah. in the states they say it friday night lights right there's a full stadium there yes sometimes more It's than what we see at saputo stadium let's be honest uh, we're, not, so, we're not you know not yeah. uh, not to be insulted but it's true it's, it's no no, no. I, true. I, well the, you know it's a big sport there it's a it's a religion like uh calcio is in italy but but you know i i noticed that you know there's there's a lot of attention against the uh um with the cjep leagues or university leagues, a lot of players that kind of lose their momentum by the time they're U17 in the AAA leagues or the PLS gear leagues, or now they they have a second a second win when they go to CJEP or university because now they feel like, okay, maybe this is the last really good team I'll play for, yeah. but my fellow students are coming. I love it. You know, I represent something. I have a logo, and you need that, you know? Yeah. And Spolitz lacks that. It doesn't have that that motivation. It's lacking a bit of the competition. That's right. That's right. So you need to to merge that with clubs so that you know it makes sense uh, that you know all that training goes to fruition and the level of you know uh, I'm sure we can play better games that after five trainings you know yeah. week, the level will be better. Pat, I want to thank you so much. Before I let you go, I like to do this with all my guests. Just some quick fire questions. You give me an answer, and uh, right. we'll take it home from there. Pat, your favorite player of all time? <laughs> Messi. Messi. Your which team do you support in which league? So my favorite team is FC Barcelona. Outside of Montreal, of course, of course. Montreal uh, of CF Montreal. That that's without without being said. 
who is in now as a coach you know is there a coach that you uh, you really admired his style and tried to emulate some of his his thought process hmm. uh it's a mix of many many coaches um obviously guardiola because he came from barcelona and i I really enjoy the style of play. I don't think it's for everyone, but I really enjoy the way, the approach, and the uh, um, the idealism. You know, it's an aesthetic. You know, I want to keep the ball, and there's a lot of thinking behind it. I like that about it. Um, but I like Jurgen Klopp. I like the energy, the drive, the passion. I I like it. I enjoy watching it too. And and I won't lie. I appreciate some of the Italian coaches that, uh, you know, they, they bring something different for sure. I, I'm not a huge fan of Antonio Conte or Diego Simeone, but I like the grit, the green tie, you know, yeah. and now uh, I'm thinking of Jason Di Tullio, yeah. uh, the teammate, of, uh, you know, and uh, he brought that fire, that, that green tie. And I feel that that's an, an element that, uh, you know, we all need, <laughs> especially in Canada. Yeah, in, in Montreal, Canada, we need it. The type of the club we are, it's part of our identity. When we look at the mirror, we should realize that if we don't have that bite, we're not going to succeed. So we really need it. And and if we can, you know, and obviously, you know, now I'm going to preach for my my own club. But what Wilfred Nasi is doing this year is really remarkable and yes. i've known him for a long time i we've we had so many conversations he really has convictions about he wants to play an attacking soccer uh but after two years you could see it on the field every game even the ones that we don't win even the ones that we don't play so well the ideas uh, they're still really clear and yeah. i admire that the players are buying into it you know and, and i overheard and read something about the, he he likes to have players who play multiple multiple positions and could be interchangeable pieces where he's not losing uh, someone due to injury and it's it's totally uh, he totally has to rethink his game plan he wants everybody to be interchangeable with one another and that's that's an amazing and amazing quality and how it. he's done it is fantastic his 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 major achievement was making all the players buy into it and they did from all the various backgrounds the academy players montreal players american players yeah. foreign players they're all buying even a veteran like kamara you know so everybody is is playing their part so that's great you know and so you know i hope he stays for a long time because yeah, I think yeah he's doing a great job amazing and the last question probably the most important pat i'm pretty sure you enjoy a plate of pasta every once in a while when you're not pumping the iron <laughs> uh, pat there's an important question especially uh, you know it, it's it's become a staple point of the local soccer show so anytime there's penny there's penne lisce and penne rigate which ones do you like Rigatti. Yes. Yeah, uh, they, Pedro, you know. Presidente Pat is a forever staple of the local <laughs> soccer show with the correct answer. Oh, okay. Pat, I, I didn't know there was a right or wrong, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, Penelishi I... Pat is basically you're taking a goldfish and you're putting it down your mouth, and it, you can't even have time to chew, you just swallow it. That's that's, it, right, that's, that's a right. Penelishi. I, I, I get Rigatti what you mean. gives you time. Look. My, my Italian teammates would bring me to their houses and yeah. they would really appreciate me because I would eat a lot, you know? Yeah. But the, the nonna and the nonno, they, they, they would like me. I yeah. eat a lot, you. Yeah. <laughs> I have a good appetite. I love pasta. Pat, amazing. An hour and 10 minutes. I want to thank you so much for this. Uh, thank you again to CF Montreal. Thank you to yourself, Pat. Uh, for, for everything you do for soccer in this, uh, in this city. And uh, again, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, guys, the local soccer show, it's exactly this, bringing you guests like Pat uh, to talk about his great experience, the, you know, what he does uh, at the grassroots level and even now at the academy and for CF Montreal. Guys, please share this with your clubs, share this with your parents. We want you to, you know, we want to share the information with everybody, but we need your help to get the local sh soccer show out there for everybody to watch. Uh, Pat, any closing words? No, let's let's go for pasta next time. Uh, you know, uh. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna make Marcello. Marcello is the president of the Milan Club Montreal, so he has the expense account. It's gonna be on him. 
when Milan plays Barcelona, actually it's Inter against Barcelona in the Champions League this year. But uh, we could yeah. still go eat because if Barcelona, if Barcelona beats Inter, we're really paying the meal. Everybody's happy. All right. <laughs> Marcello, take us away. Thank you, guys.